This is exactly right. God, we're getting good at that. We are getting great after only 2,000 episodes. Solid gold. <laughs> Welcome to my favorite murder. The mini-sode. Where we read you your shit. You love it. We read it. <laughs> we like it, too. Yeah, we we have our own kind of fun. Yeah. The subject line of this first uh, email, I was going to say podcast, that's scary, <laughs> um, is my dad was the last person to see John List Jr. alive. So if you don't remember, or if you're new, and you, or you only listen to the minisodes. Or this wait, is your first episode. Have we ever talked to the people who only listen to minisodes? That doesn't, ha- doesn't happen, does uh, it? If you're, if you're minisodes only, we'd love to hear from you. <laughs> and why are you mad at us? Yeah, what the fuck's the problem? <laughs> um, John List was the was the familiar side i'm sure i'm not pronouncing that right he's the guy that killed his whole family in their mansion because he had lost his job but he couldn't tell anybody and it it's a very dark um story that it's like we a did classic dude who kills his family and starts a new life somewhere else because he's a piece of shit yes and he had a very famous they did a very famous reconstruction of his head on i believe unsolved mysteries or america's most wanted or america's most wanted i think is what it was um and, and they found him and they found him like and he living saw his himself. new life chilling out at like whatever in like colorado yeah they always fucking run to colorado and there's a great it's in one of our episodes that you do you do him and there's a great twist at the end about the money yes that we won't tell you you have to go you have to go listen to a real episode yeah. for once sorry mini so nerd go <laughs> listen to a full episode um okay so this is the son okay. who's named after his father okay uh who was sadly murdered with the rest of the family. Oh, God. All right. Karen, Georgia, all furry friends. Big fan, let's get to this. Great. This past weekend, I evacuated to my parents' house before Hurricane Florence hit. Oh. So these are, these are emails from North and South Carolina listeners pre-Florence, but right before. Uh-huh. Uh, when, uh, while I love all the stories my dad shares, this factoid about him is probably the craziest, which he delved a little further into this weekend. My dad was John List Jr.'s best friend and the last one to see him alive before his father, also my dad's Boy Scout leader. Oh. And an extremely religious man, as my dad described him, took him home to kill the final member of his family. Oh, my God. It's so dark. I know in episode 29. Hey, oh, that's thank nice. Thank you. Good, nice work. <laughs> Would have never been. Uh, it's episode 29. You guys mentioned John Sr. went to his son's soccer game after killing his mother, wife, daughter, and other son. Jesus. My dad had told me John Jr. and him would normally walk home from practices and games together. He remembers this day because John Jr.'s dad pulled up in his <gasps> car when they were walking on Clark Street and picked his son up, which never happened, but my dad thought nothing of it. It wouldn't be until a month later when nosy teachers and neighbors right. would discover the bodies in that ballroom, which my dad also played broom <gasps> hockey in. So her dad was, or I'm assuming it's a her it is, um, her dad played broom hockey in that ballroom where he where he laid out the, the bodies. bodies holy shit. so intense he clearly remembers it as this giant room with this grand skylight mm, spoiler with absolutely no furniture in it <gasps> uh fast forward a month and the detectives are picking my father up on his way to school he told me he thought oh shit did i do something bad <laughs> my dad was definitely a total nerd so no way <laughs> And it got even more serious when they brought him to the principal's office where his parents were already waiting. They ended up asking him questions like if John Jr. had said anything to him before getting in the car or if John Sr. seemed off. I find this little tidbit of my dad's life so unique and sad, of course, since he lost his best friend in seventh grade. I look forward to seeing you ladies here in Charleston, South Carolina next week. Stay sexy and don't get murdered. Best, Isabel. Wow. Isn't that intense? What a crazy story that you know, like you're one of your parents parents has yeah that's yeah unbelievable what a fucking sad story and it's of all the stories one of the like to me it's the one it just stays with you the most and has the it's so baffling and insane and it's just so unfair it's like john list should have just fucking left and started a new life without killing his family or just fucking killed himself because he is a piece of shit just unfair he thinks that he deserves 
to live and go have a life somewhere else. Yeah. Not his family. Yeah. Like, what an asshole. Yeah. I know it's more than that, but that's what I'm going to call it. It's let's simplify things in the mini soaps. That's how we are. Yeah. These are not going to be an hour and 50 minutes long. <laughs> He's an asshole. Um, let's see. Okay. This one is uh, called Cat Calling Arson. Okay. Hi, all. Let's just jump in. <laughs> yes, let's, Lauren. Yay. <laughs> so when I was 10, 11-ish, my older cousin and I were at her parents' house. It was mid-afternoon Sunday, and our parents had gone to church to work on some youth event. We live in a fairly safe, small-town southern community in North Carolina. My cousin's house had a large, unfurnished basement with sheets hanging up everywhere to separate all the hoarded junk sitting around. Mm. That sounds creepy. Um, hiding their clutter as, a g- as good southern people do. Nice. Just hanging sheets to hide your hoarding. Just throw up a nice curtain mid-room. It's like a wall. Don't worry about <laughs> Don't it. Don't even worry about it. Uh, I was helping my cousin finish her list of chores and followed her downstairs to take another load of laundry down and grab clothes out of the dryer. The washer and dryer are located in the back of the basement in a large open room. So I'm folding clothes out of the basket and she's at the washer putting in another load and I hear this whistle. You know that. And then this part speaks to my heart because I can't whistle. So she says, you know that wheat woot guys do when they're <laughs> cock calling a lady on the street. And I fucking whit whoo that one whit whoo i can't whistle so that's all i would be able to say can you uh there you go that and it scared both the cats i think it's a way funnier and more attractive thing to just yell wheat woo wheat woo <laughs> <laughs> just like when I saw the wee woo written, like typed out, I was like, I know what you're talking about. Wee woo. Wee woo. Yeah. Uh, my cousin is mid sentence, so I look at her and go, How did you do that? And she turns around and says, What? And I'm like, Whistle mid sentence. How did you do that? <laughs> she denies she whistles and said, You clearly whistled, not me. To which I deny because I can't whistle. I still can't whistle 15 years later. <laughs> and then says, I'm sitting on the couch, fake whistling to confirm. Um, and as we are looking at each other with our mouths clearly not moving, we both hear the whistle again. Weed woo. Wee. Picture in your mind. <laughs> Wee woo. This time it's so much creepier. Yeah, this time uh, I drop the clothes and run, tearing up the stairs with my cousin not far behind me. We run up the stairs, shutting the basement door and locking it behind us. Oh, we. Call- Sorry, I just put it together. Like I knew it factually, but I just put it together. They're in a fucking basement. They're in a basement and there's sheets hanging all over, oh, hiding God. shit, and they I- hear we. Woo. You set the whole scene, and then the second it was the yeah, cat yeah. calling. You're like outside, outside in front of like a scaffolding, no. like New York City street. They're home alone in <gasps> a basement, in a basement, hoarding basement. Okay. Da, 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 da. Uh, I call her dad, who laughs us off until he hears a. We are clearly in panic and comes home from church. He's back within ten minutes with a crowbar and my dad in tow behind him, <laughs> and they go to investigate. Fuck yeah, dads. Yes. My cousin and I sit upstairs frozen until they call us down. To our horror, the basement door that leads to outside is open, which it clearly was not when we were down there. So someone was standing there in the dark behind one of those rooms curtained off by sheets, whistling at two little girls and hightailed it out the door and we screamed and ran up the stairs. My cousin's house burned down twice after that over a period of seven years. What the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. The first time, according to firefighters official reports, the fire started downstairs in the basement in the middle of a concrete floor, um, how, ruining all of downstairs and the majority of everything they owned. So they rebuilt and finished the basement. The second fire supposedly started upstairs in a bookshelf. No explanation of how or source. No candles around. Nothing. Insurance later dropped them because they could not explain how the fire started in suspected arson. Whoa. Needless to say, my cousin and I can't help but feel like that creepy Sunday afternoon whistle had something to do with the fires. Oh, and they're still living in that house. Stay sexy and if you hear a whistle, (laughs) run or move Lauren. Holy shit. How creepy is that? Also because if it, say it just is, worst case scenario, it's some sex offender that's like hiding. Yeah, like that's the worst case scenario is a sex offender hiding in the basement where two little girls are fucking doing laundry but then it would make sense That's horrible if that person continues to live and be in that yeah. house that that he's a fire starter yeah he's a fire starter wheat woo wheat woo named mr wheat woo <laughs> oh jerry wheat woo he oh, got out of jail six months ago <laughs> okay this 
subject line is from faking your own death in Mexico to owning a pizza place in South Carolina. Hello, ladies, Stephen and animals. When my husband, then boyfriend and I first moved to Columbia, South Carolina over 12 years ago, we found a group of friends to play bar trivia with. I was mostly along to write the answers on the paper to keep score and occasionally. It's a very important job. That's right. You, it has to be clear writing. Yeah. Occasionally answer a very recent bullshit pop culture <laughs> question. Amen. As this friend group was freaky smart. Love it. Over the course of four years, we won $1,000 in bar Holy tabs shit. and cash. Including two $1,000 <gasps> summer tournaments. That's amazing. Oh my God. I want to go with them. They're smart. Every Thursday, we would go to this bar called Bay's and play and win. It turns out Bay's was named after the owner, Bay Rutherford. He was around a lot. I met him on several occasions and was known for being kind of a creep Ooh. hiring and hitting on young college girls he was probably in his late 40s shorting his workers on their pay and tips and overall just being a douche thanks to an article in a local independent newspaper we learned that bay had been convicted of faking his own death Ooh. by burning a body in his car oh my along, God. <laughs> along with some of his personal effects michael clayton style in mexico in the 90s he lost a bunch of money in the stock market and he wanted a way out so he grabbed a grave in mexico what? Fuck. Burned the body in the car, threw in his medical alert bracelet and watch, Dude. which is dead on Michael Clayton, and not medical alert bracelet. <laughs> and Michael Clayton's like, I'm allergic to nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Do not resuscitate me. <laughs> and even went so far as to take a tooth from the dead guy <gasps> and give it to his wife to give to investigators if they came around. Did she, so she knew. And she I was must like, here's have. my DNA. And they're like, this is rotten. Um, <laughs> well, Holy also, shit. Also, forensic dentistry doesn't work that way where they're like, uh, yes, ma'am. Do you have any of your husband's teeth? <laughs> yeah. We need to take them yeah. in. That's the only way we can get it. It's the only way. He had $7 million <laughs> out in life insurance on himself. Too much, too much life insurance. That's seven red flags. Yeah. And he was hoping to cash it in later when his wife claimed it. Luckily, a bone expert noticed some inconsistencies from the burned body mm. and figured out it wasn't Bay. Nice. He was caught in NYC, convicted, and served five years, which is the max. That's it? I, she says the max, I think. Okay. Um, before we heard about this, we almost felt bad for going to Bay's almost every Thursday for over a year and a half and never spending an actual dime of our own money. <laughs> but fuck that guy. <laughs> the faking his death part of the story can be watched on Forensic Files mm. Season 8 episode 31 oh, that's good or collection for episode 14 on netflix love wow it. love your specificity Thorough. you should fucking you should play uh trivia trivia about netflix and forensic files that's right love your show can't wait to see you in charleston next month um which is pretty soon stay sexy don't feel bad about winning money from a felon lauren that's good that's a good one yeah that's two laurens so far yeah that's right Wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like a victimless crime because you're just fucking over a fucking life insurance corporation. But the body who they stole from belonged to a family. Yes. And that's got to just be traumatizing. Yes. All over again. Someone's father or yeah. uncle or relative totally. brother. It's well, also just the idea that you would be enough of a creep to be like, oh, I want to keep my money. I'm going to I'm going to dig up a body yeah like and take a tooth from it come on guys let's not don't have some accountability please stop it with america's number one meal kit hello fresh you'll get easy seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door all you have to do is cook and enjoy hello fresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality from step-by-step -step recipes to pre-measured ingredients, you'll have everything you need to get a wow-worthy dinner on the table in about 30 minutes. Say goodbye to endless grocery store trips and takeout. HelloFresh has you covered. There's something for everyone, from family recipes to calorie smart and vegetarian, and fun menu series like Hall of Fame and, and Kraft Burgers. HelloFresh has more five-star recipes than any other meal kit, so you'll know you're getting something incredible. HelloFresh is flexible, and it fits your lifestyle, easily change your delivery days, food preferences and skip a week whenever you need. Break out of your dinnerette and make deliciousness part of every week with HelloFresh. 
I love that even though HelloFresh is super easy and they make it really basic and like straightforward, you still feel like you're cooking this like incredible home cooked dinner. And that makes me feel good about myself. And that instead of just ordering takeout, I'm actually making something and preparing something at home. And that just, it feels good. So for $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash Murder80 and enter Murder80. It's like receiving eight meals for free only at HelloFresh.com slash Murder80, promo code Murder80. Go by. Uh, this is called, I'm not going to tell you the name of it, but it's lighthearted. Okay. Okay. All right. No introduction. Straight to the post. <laughs> yes. To the point, they said. Oh. My mom and I used to have a summer home in North Carolina. One summer, roughly 15 years ago, when I was about eight, our Jack Russell Terrier, Jill, started going insane. Jack and Jill, because she was a Jack Russell. <laughs> Jack and Jill. That's cute. Started going insane. She would run around barking, staring at the walls and ceilings. During this time, some of our stuff went missing. Just a few small things that weren't important enough to worry about. Mm. <laughs> One night my mom came into my room to check if I was asleep Only to find a tiny furry creature with huge eyes Staring at her while drinking out of my glass of water What? <laughs> uh, turns out there was a family of flying squirrels living in our tiny <laughs> attic This is a this is a finding things in the wall story by the way Why? How cute would that be? You open the door and there's just a little tiny tongue <laughs> Looking into it Oh, it's so cute. Unless it's rabid. Okay. Yes, and next to your child. Yep. My mom watched as a squirrel flew through the air right next to her face and dashed into my bathroom. And then it says, flying squirrels could fly very well, even though it's actually just gliding. Not knowing what else to do, she shut the door and covered the crack at the bottom with a towel. <laughs> then she went to grab a butterfly net. Not sure that would have helped much. <laughs> when she went back into my bathroom, net in hand, she saw this squirrel in my bathtub. And this is all caps, and it kills me. Playing with my bath toys. <laughs> <laughs> let it live there <laughs> startled the squirrel made its way to a slightly ajar cabinet and through the tiniest and through the tiniest hole in the wall my oh. mom realized that the butterfly net would not be sufficient in catching the creature and called a pest control or some other animal removal company the following day it was playing with her bath that's it was just like i'm a baby so cute it's so cute uh they came within a day or so and found that they had made our attic their new home <laughs> they removed the family flying squirrels and released them outside i'm not sure where but far enough away that they couldn't come back once they were gone we got to see everything they had stashed up there because all that tiny <gasps> shit was going yes. missing sure enough all the things that had been going missing were there including several of my bath toys and my favorite eye pillow <laughs> <laughs> they were just taking shit and running off they basically that bathroom had become like their fao schwartz they were just like yeah. check out this sponge that's shaped like an ice cream cone i am freaking out i just love like the idea that a squirrel who you think is just like a boring thing was like this toy is the best yeah. i'm taking it it's and i'm gonna now. go back for more that's right uh it was good to find our stuff as well as to know that our dog was not actually crazy about that issue <laughs> though she still was nuts pun intended um oh, i get it sex stay sexy remember your crazy dog might actually have a point yeah. natalie oh natalie that's a good one <laughs> yeah mm. that's so cute <laughs> flying squirrel drinking out of a glass <laughs> look, 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 look. <laughs> pardon me look, look. okay the subject line of this is my literal job is finding stuff in walls <gasps> this is this is slightly long but it's really worth it i am here for it hi karen in georgia Imagine my delight when I realized your obsession with finding shit in walls was very real. Clearly, you were operating on my level obs of obsession, which is basically the doctoral level of finding shit in <gasps> walls. I am director of museums for Historic Charleston Foundation in Charleston. Oh, my God. South Carolina. Uh, Charleston, that's a whole sentence. As a historian and preservationist in charge of two sites in the historic district, we find, mm. all caps, a lot of shit in walls. Here's the latest and greatest story. One of the house museums I oversee is called the Nathaniel Russell House. It was built by, hey, you guessed it, Nathaniel Russell in 19, in 1808. Wow. The original house consisted of an enormous three-story federal mansion, kitchen house, carriage house, workyard, and garden. Russell moved into the house in the spring of 1808 with his wife, two daughters, aged 19 and 17, and 18 enslaved men and women. Ooh. We have owned the Russell House since 1955, and since 1989, much time, funding, and effort has been poured into the study and restoration of the main house. As such, it is a pristine example of the towering wealth of slave owners mm. in the 
early 19th century, whereas the areas inhabited by those 18 enslaved people were used for offices or storage and were not considered essential to the telling of the full history of the house. Sorry. All right. Needless to say, that line of thinking has evolved. And last year, we began an intensive study of the kitchen house to learn more about the lives of those living and working in the kitchen, laundry, and living quarters between 1808 and 1865. I should add that uh, since very little about the daily lives of enslaved sur- uh, of the enslaved survives in written record, it's only through forensic evidence and archaeology that we're able to piece together what life was like. Wow. Even microscopic traces of paint can tell us volumes <gasps> about a room from 200 years ago. <gasps> we began our study of the kitchen house by assessing the structure and realized that the upstairs living quarters were drywalled in the early 20th century. Oh, shit. And we could hear voids behind it when we tapped <gasps> along the walls. A a contractor on our team used a very small reciprocating straw to cut a small hole in the drywall, and we were astounded by what we found underneath. Behind the drywall, perfectly encapsulated, was the original plaster walls of the first period slave quarter. Holy quarters, shit. Uh, complete with original lime wash. We were amazed since features like this don't survive 200 years of renovation. But as we removed drywall, we realized that practically everything in the room was original to the period of enslavement. Plaster, woodwork, paint finishes, window sashes, doors, everything. <sighs> as the drywall came down, the room transformed and we were looking at the same walls from some uh, from the early 1800s. Oh my god. It was incredible an incredibly emotional day thinking about how everything we could see was built by the enslaved from the bricks and mortar to the plaster and paint and these surfaces hadn't been seen for at least 100 years. This was a living space for enslaved people and probably the only place in the house they could have a moment peace if any. It was like a sacred place to say the least. So then it gets better. Oh my god. As we rounded the corner and continued to remove drywall we discovered tons of debris packed in between the studs and baseboards. Well, all that shit ended up being the remains of several undisturbed rat's nests. (gasps) Before you freak out, finding a rat's nest is like Christmas morning for preservationists. Oh, because they take it and run. Yep. We were literally jumping for joy. Holy shit. Um... Rats tend to gather items from a 50 foot radius, pack it in there, and then pee all over it. And thankfully, rat pee is a preservative. Holy shit. <laughs> so even if a nest is hundreds of years old, the things in it tend to stay intact over many years. Oh my God. They're like tiny time capsules. If time capsules were full of gnawed bones, mummified rat poop, and sh- a shitload of sweet artifacts. Fun. We wasted no time pulling all that shit literally out of the walls. I'll attach a photo of us combing through through one night rat one of eight rat nests oh my God. so you can see how much debris we are talking about we spent several days painstakingly combing through the debris and removing artifacts we uncovered hundreds of artifacts these fucking rats had straight up stolen from the people living in the ha- kitchen house we found buttons stockings marbles straight pins a portion of a waistcoat a veil from a bonnet hundreds of bones from butchered animals they were likely stealing these from the kitchen one floor down we found a small lidded paper box containing a cake of maple makeup. Oh my god. The most exciting finds, however, were two fragments of paper. One was a minuscule bit of newspaper with the name Crookshank on it. My colleague was quickly able to search the historic newspaper database and match it with the digitized original, which dated from November 1833. Holy shit. It was incredible to know that everything we were looking at was from such an early period. However, it gets better. The most intriguing artifact retrieved from the nest was a tiny fragment of a reading primer. This one made us all tear up when we realized what it was you see reading and writing was illegal for enslaved people in south carolina in 1833 despite this someone living above the kitchen at the russell house got their hands on a reading primer and were possibly learning to read and write holding the physical evidence of potential resistance was one of the most powerful moments of my oh, career. Wow. So that's my touching story of finding shit in walls. The kitchen house restoration is still ongoing. You can come see it when you come to Dude. Charleston in September. Dude. And we are in the fundraising period now, hoping to fund a full restoration of the kitchen house so it can be put on public view along with the artifacts we pulled out of the walls. Telling the story, the full story of Charleston and its complicated and painful full past is basically my reason for living at this point so it is important especially in this political climate thank you so much for keeping me company during long hours of cataloging museum objects you guys are the best cannot wait to see you in september ssdgm lauren 
Lauren number three. Look. Oh, really? Yeah, that's crazy. Holy shit, that is incredible. Isn't what that amazing? An so incredible story. If you, the she's the director of museums for the Historic Charleston Foundation. So whenever the Historic Charleston Foundation starts that fun fundraising campaign. I, I, there's nothing I'd love more than to see that Dude, house. Me too. Well, we're actually, so we're recording this early because we're going this weekend to our tour. So we yes. just, let's just go knock on that fucking <laughs> we'll house like, door. Hi. Hi can you come in? We'll go there, but we'll be wearing gloves and yeah. masks and booties on our shoes. Totally. Um, um, Steven has the photos. Oh, oh. We'll put them up on Instagram and Twitter and shit. Oh my God. And Facebook. That's so <gasps> much stuff. See. Oh, that is creepy and looks so much fun. Wow, look that's at all those like bones. that's very. It's like American Indiana Jones. Um, can people who are who work in museums? I know, like a lot of museums have their like their shit that they that they just store that they don't have out. Like, send us the weirdest thing you have, or the creepiest thing you have, or your the th your favorite thing that you have in there. It sounds like you're trying to rip off Don Wildman's Mysteries of the Museum. Please, <laughs> essentially Don Wildman us. <laughs> We want to get bite that Don Wildman That's style. That's right. And we want you to mysteries at the museum email us. Well, because there's nothing more fascinating than no, it's the real, best. the real stuff. Yeah. The real, the real history. Which is, by the way, you should watch the show. It's a great show. Yes. However, <laughs> we want the ones that Don Wildman does not <laughs> They can't tell every story. Yeah, it's right. We will. Listen, uh, send us a whistle. Send us a wee woo. Wee woo us. At my favorite murder at Gmail. <laughs> And uh, send us a whistle. Send us a whistle. <laughs> Wheat woo at us. <laughs> and uh, stay sexy. And don't get murdered. <clears throat> Goodbye. Goodbye. Elvis, you want a cookie? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Wheat woo. He just wheat wooed. He wheat wooed. Wheat woo.